So it's yes. a pleasure to have the second talk of this session by Thibaut de Moore, which is about radiative contributions to gravitational scattering. Okay, do you see well my, my screen here? Or? We see your screen and okay. your cursor. Yeah. And the cursor. Okay, good. Yeah. So, uh, oh, la, la. but now, yes. Now I have to go to the next slide. Okay, it works this way. So, um, Mao Zeng's talk has already beautifully presented the, the context of what I'm going to talk about. Let me get rid of this thing. Uh, oops, yes. Um, how the, the use of modern scattering amplitude techniques has uh, recently um, given very important results. Uh, most of my talk will be a complementary um, view um, still on scattering uh, and radiative effects in scattering. Let me first um, remind you of the main approximation methods which have been used for the two-body gravitational problem. The post-Newtonian approximation, which is an expansion in the dimensionless parameter V over C, um, uh, which means expansion in, in 1 over C, uh, but also in um, GM over C square B, um, the gravitational potential. The post minkowski approximation does not assume a small V over C, but is an expansion in Newton's constant or physically in the gravitational potential or at, let's say, the impact parameter. Now, uh, for LIGO-Virgo purposes, actually, we are mostly interested in bound systems where there is a relation between the gravitational potential and V over C squared by the Virial theorem. Um, and we will have to keep this in mind. Just also as a, a pre-information, um, we will discuss radiation reaction effects in general relativity. Usually in textbooks, people say that radiation reaction effects uh, involve odd powers of 1 over C, starting with 1 over C to the 5, which is the leading order radiation reaction in general relativity, and then going to 1 over C7, and then you expect 1 over C9. But actually, we will see that um, ultra soft gravitons, or classically what are called tail effects, call long range interactions, which are both uh, conservative and dissipative, and which in particular include uh, radiation reaction at the 1 over C8 level, which is uh, a formally conservative uh, level. Okay. Now, let me also remind you of what is really needed for LIGO-Virgo data analysis. So the basic point of LIGO-Virgo is that what you, the, the, the broadband noise effect on the fractional variation of the length of the arms of the interferometers, the four kilometer arms uh, of the LIGO and Virgo interferometers, the broadband noise creates fluctuations at any moment which are at the level of 10 to the minus 18, while the gravitational wave signals are always below 10 to the minus 21. So you see that the gravitational wave signal you are looking for is three orders of magnitude below the broadband noise, uh, instantaneous noise inter interferometer. So we are talking about very weak uh, signals that you have to dig out of the noise. There are, um, LIGO Virgo is using several um, methods to do that, both uh, online methods to have a quick information that maybe there is a signal, and then offline uh, methods that allow really to analyze the systems, extract parameters, and have confidence that you see something. These offline uh, data analysis, they are essentially based on a match filter method, which means that you have to know in advance the shape of the signal you look for. And this is a typical waveform for the uh, coalescence of two black holes, where the first part of the waveform is coming from the in-spiral motion. The last orbits and the merger create this maximum in the waveform. 
And after this, you have the ring down when the two black holes have merged. So you need to compute hundreds of thousands of possible waveforms of this type depending on masses and spin, and then do a correlation with your um, noisy signal to know uh, that you have detected something and measure the parameters. Now, um, so from the classical point of view, what you want to do is to solve the motion of uh, two black holes. So this is a space-time diagram where time goes up and space is uh, horizontal. So here, this is not a DNA molecule, but this is the, the two horizons of two black holes going around each other in elliptical-like orbits for hundreds of millions of years. And then they radiate gravitational waves all the time. And this radiation, uh, sorry, has a back effect, has a back effect on the motion it, uh, it gives radiation reaction, which means the, the motion accelerates, they get closer and closer, and then they emit more and more gravitational waves until the two black holes merge and oscillate when they merge, and then this creates the last signal. So, uh, so in principle, from the classical point of view, you want to solve uh, from a space-time and from Einstein equations. And here I have written explicitly Einstein's equations in harmonic gauge, they are both uh, complicated and they could be worse than that. Uh, you want to compute really the waveform, okay? The waveform includes information about the dynamics, the radiation reaction, and the, the wave emission. Now, um, one of the prime methods which have been uh, successful in predicting analytically gravitational um, waveforms, and that will play a role in what I will talk about, tell you about is the effective one body approach. I want to mention that actually the initial idea of this was historically rooted in the paper of Brezin, Itikson, Zin, Justin of 1970, in which they were studying the resummation of econal, econal resummation of scattering amplitudes in QED in order to take into account um, two body effects by uh, somehow um, mapping this two-body uh, equinal resum uh, amplitude onto uh, a charged particle in an external Coulomb field, okay? So this was the initial idea. And in general activity, the idea is therefore to start from the knowledge of the dynamics of two world lines. The world lines here are the black uh, heavy, let's say, uh, lines. Uh, and they interact via the emission of gravitons, both classically and quantum mechanically. All those diagrams are classical. This is the one graviton exchange or linearized gravity. This takes into account first nonlinear effects in, in gravity, um, second nonlinear effects in gravity, uh, etc. So this gives a very complicated real two body Hamiltonian for the conservative dynamics. And the idea is to generalize the beautiful result of Newton that the two-body problem in Newtonian gravity can be mapped onto a much simpler one body of effective mass mu moving in an external gravitational potential, which in Newtonian gravity is the, the interaction potential of the two bodies. So the idea here is that you don't know in advance what would be the external gravitational effect of having this complicated two-body interaction, but you assume that there will be an effective metric. You look for an effective metric such that um, a particle of mass mu moving in this effective metric, which would give this mass shell constraint for the relative motion. Yeah, I should say that you are considering the motion in the center of mass frame, so you are looking at the the motion of just the, the relative motion. So it's like a particle, uh, only three degrees of freedom, let us say. And you look for a mass shell constraint, which looks like nu square plus p square in some effective metric, plus extra terms that you will need to add. Then, um, then you want to find a, a rule for mapping the real complicated two-body problem on this simpler mass shell constraint. For this, 
you think about uh, quantum mechanically about the fact that if you were quantizing the two body problem, you would have some energy levels. If you were quantizing the one body effective problem, you would also have different energy levels. And you want to have a one to one map between one level here and one level here. When you do that, you find that the energy of the effective problem, the constant of motion P0 in this mass shell condition has to be related to the square of the real energy or Mandelstam S variable minus M1 square minus M2 square divided by two, the sum of the two masses. And um, to finish quickly my review, what I want to say is that ba the basic ingredients that allow you to compute waveforms from the EOB formalism is you have Hamilton's equations of motion with some Hamiltonian describing the conservative part of the dynamics, but you also include, like for instance, in the angular momentum change of the two body system, the angular momentum uh, uh, loss, it's a radiation reaction force, and you compute this radiation reaction force as being linked to the angular momentum loss of the emitted waveform, but the emitted waveform is itself computed from the motion by resumming everything you know about the multipolar emission, resumming an infinite number of logs here and uh, what you cannot resume, you, 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 you compactify it in some uh, expression that looks good. And at the end, what it gives is you can solve this uh, radiation reacted uh, equation of motion, which describes the relative motion. You can compute at the same moment what is the waveform. And this formalism uh, was the first analytical formalism, which allowed to compute this up to, sorry, up to the uh, merger, that is to say. Uh, it is not limited because of the resummation of all the information. You are not limited to uh, being far that the two bodies be far away. You can go nearly to the moment where the two body merge. And at the moment where the formalism says that the two body merge, you add a ring down waveform due to the ringing black hole made of the merging of the two initial black holes. Okay, so we will need uh, whatever uh, is obtained from any methods, if you want to, uh, to compute something useful for LIGO Virgo, you need a conservative dynamics, a radiation reaction, and a waveform. Let me quickly also say what is the state of the art for the post Newtonian PN expanded uh, dynamics. So, uh, as Mao reminded us, the, the 1 PN uh, V square over C square correction beyond Newton. Um, dynamics was obtained in the early days of uh, general relativity, and Einstein Feld of Mind contributed something conceptually important. The, the 2 pn level was obtained only in 1982 in a complete form, and I should say that it was obtained from a post Minkowskian calculation, actually, uh, from a one loop uh, or G square post Minkowskian uh, computation. And uh, at the level, the motivation for this was the binary pulsar. And then when it became clear that uh, coalescing binary black hole would need higher accuracy, um, one pushed the methods to higher order. Then the third post-Newton was obtained in 2001. The 4 pn was obtained in 2014. And what will be very important in the following is that at the level 4 pn, which actually means G4 over C8, that is to say, fourth order in G for PM, but also for PN, there is a non-locality in time coming in, which classically means that the system of two bodies is as emitted in the past uh, soft gravitational waves, uh, which have traveled in space-time and scattered back on the curvature generated by the total mass of the system on the uh, back on the system. And this gives an interaction over infinite time distances from the, let's say, diagrammatic point of view. This means a diagram which is here at three loops, where some of the gravitons are really ultra soft, which means they are nearly on shell, nearly radiative gravitons and uh, correspond to these very long things. OK, recently also, as I will describe in more details, there a new method has been invented within 
post-Newton traditional, let's say classical method, which had allowed to compute go beyond 4 p.m. at 5 p.m. and 6 p.m. But at 5 p.m., for instance, there are two unknown um, parameters coming in that uh, need uh, extra information. I will not discuss here uh, spin effects. Um, a lot of work has gone into spin effect. Uh, quickly, the state of the art on the gravitational wave flux in a PN expanded way is limited actually to the 3.5 PN hula level. What happened? Uh, uh, I lost my... Uh, my screen. Do you know, okay, what should I do? Reopen, Emil, are you keynote? Yeah. Try, try to share screen again. again. Yes, yeah, sorry, keynote, quit, quitted, okay, ignore. So uh, let me reopen keynote. If not, I can use a PDF. Okay, amplitudes. Is that? It's here. Okay. Uh, view or share, uh, play slideshow. Okay. Otherwise, try the PDF. Yes. Let me. It did not like this, maybe, yes, sorry. Uh, okay, just to say, uh, maybe I can uh, delete this. Okay, quickly, the, and the reason is that there is currently a bottleneck which is at 4 p.m. due to infrared divergences um, connecting near zone effects and, and wave zone effects. So I will not discuss more of this. Concerning the post-Minkowskian dynamics, uh, post Minkowskian gravity, both for dynamics and gravitational wave losses. Let me very quickly say you, that. You can't see your slide. You can, your slide is not on. Ah, sorry. I need to, sorry, to share screen again. Or what? Yeah. Probably. Sorry. See it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Now you should see it. Yeah. Sorry about this place, slideshow. Okay, um, yes, so the breakthrough result, uh, first, I should say that the state of the art has been uh, after classical things in the 80s, uh, quantum amplitudes have, um, the first breakthrough was due to Amati Ciafaloni Veneziano in 1990 for the massless case, high energy uh, scattering of uh, nearly massless particle, they computed the two loop um, scattering and uh, for the massive case uh, of any um, velocity, the breakthrough came from Bern, Cheng, Broiban, Shen, Solon, and Zeng in 1919, which have been then um, re-verified and amplified, I, as I will discuss. Recently, uh, some partial results, which concerns the conservative potential graviton only result at G4 has been obtained concerning gravitational wave losses after early works in the 70s by Kovacs and Thorne that wrote down the integrand but could not compute the integral. integral. Uh, recently, uh, Herman et al. have succeeded in computing the four momentum losses, and I was able to compute by a much simpler calculation the angular momentum um, loss. So let me quickly um, mention this method, the recently developed method called Tutti Frutti, it's called Tutti Frutti because it combines many different tools, including post-Minkowskian, multipolar post-Minkowskian tools, self-force, which means um, uh, first order in, uh, in self-gravity in an external background. What I want to emphasize is, for instance, at 5 p.m., where the Hamiltonian contains many terms that contain powers of momenta and powers of the gravitational potential denoted u here, and contains also powers of the symmetric mass ratio nu of the two bodies. Uh, among the many terms that exist, all of them could be computed, except two numerical coefficients that could not be uh, computed. And we will come back to this. Uh, 
Yes, so what is important in um, at this stage, as soon as you go beyond the 4 p.m. level and 4 p.m. level, you need to take into account, as I said, non-local non actions. So non-local actions are these interactions mediated by very soft gravitons over long distances, or here in, in this diagram. So uh, there, is, there is a way to um, do it in this method. And what I want to say on this slide is not only you, you do it, but you can transform this complicated non-local Hamiltonian. So it's not the usual Hamiltonian function of position and velocity. It contains integral over the time. But actually, for LIGO Virgo purposes in the EOB method, you can replace it by its Delaunay expansion. So what I want to say is this method gives complete results in principle. They have been computed up to 6 p.m., but they can be computed to any order by uh, non-amplitude methods at G4. So it gives um, a way to uh, anticipate and compare what the, uh, any G4 calculation should obtain. It is only at the G5 and G6 and uh, G7 level that there are unknown parameters coming in. Now, uh, I want first, yes, to mention that be, these um, non-local effects due to ultra soft gravitons, they contribute both conservative and dissipative effects. These type of diagrams uh, contain uh, a conservative part, a time symmetric part, if you want, in the usual gravitational sense, and a time dissymmetric part. And the time symmetric part uh, can be uh, computed, as I said, modulo two parameters. Recently, we were able to combine results by Fofas Turani, Bloomline et al. to compute the two missing um, coefficients, except that we could only, uh, in consistency with what Bloomline had obtained, the pi square terms, the transcendental terms, they are also rational contributions, but we could compute these rational contributions, but they are computed as combinations of uh, of terms that describe this type of, um, of uh, actions, you know, uh, interactions between the quadrupole, the quadrupole and the angular momentum or three quadrupoles. These terms are, are local terms. Uh, Fofa and Suani have proposed estimates of the value of this coefficient, but we have shown that these coefficients are inconsistent with uh, other results. So, this discrepancy is uh, not yet uh, resolved. It is probably linked to the choice of Green's function because now at this level, it is very important to know whether you talk about a physical uh, uh, interaction involving only retarded interactions or time symmetric conservative interactions or Feynman uh, things which differ. The Feynman integral is symmetric, but it, it has an imaginary part. And also there are effects linked to uh, square in the, of the radiation reaction, which poses new challenge. Now, let me come to the main um, things that I want to discuss. Conservative versus radiation reacted uh, scattering. So uh, classically, you have two bodies uh, scattering under gravity. When you do conservative scattering, classically in the fokker wheeler feynman way, you assume that the gravitational interaction are time symmetric, which means that you have as much gravitational waves coming in as coming out during the scattering. So you do not lose energy uh, and angular momentum and linear momentum, nothing. Why physically you want to describe these radiation reacted things, okay? Now, uh, and these effects that for a long time, people thought, okay, we will add them when we will need, need them. Surprisingly, they are very important at high energy. This was the big surprise in a sense. Now, let me also say something uh, that from the, if you have, if you compute the classical scattering angle in the conservative case, and you expand it in powers of uh, Newton's constant, which is equivalent to expand it in inverse angular momentum or inverse impact parameter. You have a first term, chi one, a second term, a third term, chi three. And actually it is extremely easy to, uh, as I have shown, to transform the information in chi one, chi two, chi three directly 
in the effective one body description, the effective metric you find can be, must be taken to be the Schwarzschild metric. And then you have extra energy dependent terms, which are in one over R square, one over R cube, one over R four, depending on the here. And then this coefficient Q2, Q3 are simple combination of chi2 and chi3. So it's just linear combination of the scattering that give immediately the Hamiltonian, okay? And now what was surprising is uh, before the result of Osvibern, actually, I had uh, studied the, the, I had transformed the result of Amati Chafoloni Veneziano into an effective um, EOB Hamiltonian. Uh, and then uh, when the result of uh, Bern et al came out, uh, a discrepancy um, displayed itself in the sense that the 3 p.m. results, conservative results of Zwiebern uh, et al, contain a logarithmic divergence at high energy, which means that it's a scattering angle instead of having an expansion in powers of gamma, the Lorentz factor over J, uh, contain a log of gamma uh, infinity, while the result of Amati Chafalani Veneziano did not contain uh, such uh, a log of gamma. So for um, several months, uh, one year, uh, there was this puzzle. Uh, is there um, something wrong? Is there, uh, what is the connection with Amati Chafaloni Veneziano? And the, the resolution of this uh, was first suggested uh, in supergravity by um, Divekia um, et al. Uh, and then um, I could do a, a direct calculation in classical gravity. That is to say, taking into account radiation reaction in the scattering angle, uh, using a formula that had been derived before, which connects the radiation reaction part of the scattering angle to the loss of energy and the loss of angular momentum. And at the level G cube, it is enough to compute the loss of angular momentum because angular momentum is lower order in powers of uh, G. And actually the computation of the, this term was quite easy and, and gave a result uh, which canceled the, the, the high energy uh, uh, puzzling uh, result in Bern et al. So that radiation reaction is very important at high energy and, and gives a finite uh, result when you add it to the conservative dynamics. Now, uh, recently, Yes, I should say this. This result uh, 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 prompted by result of Hermann et al. Yes, Hermann et al. And you will have a talk by Hermann uh, in the coming hour. Uh, has used the Kosover, uh, maybe uh, O'Connell uh, formalism from uh, amplitude to compute the uh, impulse, that is to say the change of, uh, of uh, four momentum of, let's say, the first particle, including radiation reaction, and they obtain a certain formula uh, by using amplitude techniques. Recently, with Bini and Geralico, we have shown that this result can be obtained by a, a simple extension of our previous result, something uh, quite simple, and in a few lines, you can derive the impulse. Uh, and then we could also predict from this thing, uh, what would be the impulse with radiation reaction contribution at order G4 and, and G5, which means including effects. Uh, uh, so we could compute them, but not in an exact PM way. Uh, at this order, we could use, we could reproduce this in a PM way using the results for the energy loss why at higher order, we can compute them, but only at order one over C5 plus one over C7, plus the tail effects one over C8 plus one over C9. Uh, beyond that, we don't know how to compute it. Uh, the last point, ah, I'm going too fast actually. Uh, maybe I forgot some slides. Let me go back quickly. Uh, what did I want to say here? Yes, no, no, it's okay. That uh, I've just been too fast. Uh, it will leave time for questions, that's good. Uh, yes, yes. Now, uh, up to now, 
I have uh, discussed the connection between um, recent results obtained by amplitude techniques, uh, so quantum scattering uh, amplitudes, and, um, and quantities of importance for the classical scattering of two uh, large mass bodies, two black holes. Uh, I want to mention, actually, yes, there is an issue here for the future of these calculations. Maybe something is missing from these transparencies here. Uh, what, no, no, it's here. Yes. Uh, I want to mention another use of, uh, let's say, collider um, motivated uh, information about uh, integrals that, uh, that is also linked to radiative effects. Because in the course of the development of the tutti frutti method, we need to compute, as I said, the effects of ultra soft gravitons on the dynamics and in particular on the scattering angle. So it means you remember that we had this, sorry, uh, let me go back if I can. Yes, we had this action just to show the action. Yes, the effective action for the interaction of two bodies contain uh, double integrals over T and T prime of um, the gravitational wave emission, but split between two times. The gravitational wave flux would be like, this is the quadrupole formula of Einstein. The, the third derivative of the quadrupole moment square gives the instantaneous energy flux. If you split the two times in T and T prime in this quadratic form, and you do the same thing for the octupole and the, the magnetic quadrupole, you, you can compute the effective action, okay? But, uh, and then you can compute from this effective action, what is the scattering angle induced by this conservative okay. non-local radiation graviton effect, okay? But when you do that, you have quite complicated intervals, okay? And uh, we, we, we derived the explicit form of these integrals. So these integrals are double integrals over T and T prime. This capital T is a modified time, which instead of going from minus infinity to plus infinity, goes to minus one to plus one. So it is a compact support integral. And the integrand uh, for this classical scattering angle is a sum of terms with uh, very complicated rational functions like ratio of polynomials of very high orders. And then you have powers of differences of arc tangent or differences of arc tang, okay? Which means objects of weight one here and objects of weight one to some powers, okay? And when we got this, we, uh, we tried to compute them numerically and we did to some accuracy, but not very accurately. And then we put this as a challenge to our particle physics friend saying, can you help us, uh, can you compute these integrals, okay? And we got a positive answer from uh, Stefano Laporta and uh, Pierpaolo Mastrolia, where they said, oh yes, we know how to do that. Some of your integrals look like that. But then we can compute this in terms of what we know very well, harmonic polylogs. Uh, all these harmonic polylogs finally are estimated at fourth roots of unity. And all that allowed to compute all the integrals needed for this classical tutti frutti methods, okay? In particular, when computing with the tutti frutti methods, we had one unknown coefficient, um, this one, and uh, at the end, we could compute it uh, thanks to this uh, method. By the way, I should say that I learned recently um, from uh, Sasha Goncharov that uh, although Sasha Goncharov was telling me he cannot compute really the explicit value of all these intervals, but at least with his uh, understanding, he, he can understand why these objects, for instance, uh, um, which are weight four, is the product of pi by zeta three uh, and not more complicated things. Okay, so this is so this shows that the accumulated knowledge from 
particle physics and also mathematicians can be useful for these radiative corrections in gravity. Okay. Now, the last point that I want to uh, remind. Uh, so just a 10 minute mark. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, is something of your uh, uh, great uh, uncle or great great uncle, Emil. Uh, so um, I want to remind people that Niels Bohr in 1948 insisted uh, in, um, in saying that the domain of validity of the born Feynman expansion must assume that the uh, gravitational analog of the fine structure constant, this dimensionless coupling, G M1, M2, or more generally G E1, E2, if you go to high energy uh, scattering divided by H bar, uh, or actually uh, in this case divided by h bar uh, v. Uh, this uh, thing must be much smaller uh, than one for the usual quantum scattering, quantum perturbation theory. Why the classical scattering uh, demands that this quantity is much larger than one, which means, uh, which means physically that there is a big difference whether the wave packet one can make wave packets that um, se keep separated during the scattering. For this, you need this condition. Why the quantum uh, validity regime is when the wave packets uh, overlap and have a, a diffusion angle, which is uh, larger than the scattering angle, okay? So for me, this is still, I know that up to now, uh, using, for instance, the crossover, maybe O'Connell uh, formalism, which in itself is exact, but injecting in this formalism the, uh, the usual uh, Feynman expansion uh, in the domain of validity, which is not its domain of validity. Up to now, the results at G cube have agreed with the classical derivation I have just uh, sketched, but I wonder whether this will be true um, at all orders, okay? Anyway, independently of this, it is clear that the G4 scattering uh, computation, which are ongoing, because as I said, the group of Zwiebern has obtained only a partial answer, uh, which has been uh, checked by the, the group of Rafael Porto, uh, by other methods, and uh, only the potential graviton uh, answer. So it lacks, uh, all those radiative effects, both the conservative one and the uh, dissipative ones. And it will be interesting to see uh, if it will put to the test whether modern amplitude, amplitude techniques uh, can efficiently provide LIGO useful results. And the aim of our recent paper was to provide a PN expanded uh, value for these terms to compare to forthcoming results. So it will be an interesting dialogue to continue. The dialogue has been going on between Zwiebern and others, including me, uh, for several years already. So uh, to conclude, um, analytical approaches to gravitational wave signals have played and continue to play a crucial role for the, uh, the waveform definitions and therefore the template computation and the interpretation of LIGO-Virgo data. And it is true that the, the fact that uh, future gravitational wave detectors will be more accurate demands that we improve our analytical knowledge by all possible means. Uh, quantum scattering techniques have um, given very beautiful uh, results, but we have to uh, remind ourselves of the graphs showing that um, these techniques now uh, have difficulties at the uh, G4 level, which is the three loop uh, level, why traditional, I mean, not, not only traditional, but recent uh, EFT based method and the recent tutti frutti method have allowed to go to the 5pn and 6pn level modulo two unknown parameters. And at this level, you include, you know, fifth, sixth, and seventh power of G. So uh, you go to uh, six loop, actually, okay? Uh, anyway, it's, uh, it is important to pursue all those approaches in, in parallel. As I said, there are discrepancies now 
between some EFT computations and our computations at the 5PN level. Uh, it would be very important to resolve this discrepancy and compute the two remaining parameters D5 and A6, because this way one can have the full 5PN uh, dynamics. To conclude, I just want to mention that Henri Poincaré, who had worked for many years on uh, the problem of motion of uh, end body, uh, concluded that uh, there are no definitely solved problems. There are only more or less solved problems. And it is clear that the two body generativistic problem uh, will probably always remain a more or less solved problem. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for a very nice talk. And let's give uh, Tibor uh, applause. So uh, we have a little bit of time. So are there any questions, comments? I see that Julio has a comment. Yes. Uh, thanks a lot, Tibor, for a very nice talk. Uh, you just uh, briefly commented on these um, radiation reaction squared contributions. Uh, can you say a bit more about them other than they exist starting at 5 p.m. Uh, you already know at this stage, <laughs> I cannot. We have put in our uh, paper everything we everything we know at this stage. You know, so I'm not hiding things. Uh, it is uh, conceptually, in principle, it's not a problem. But given the information we have, it it remains something we cannot uh, be more precise about now. Sorry. But in, but there is a way to compute them using classical methods. There's you don't yes, see yes, any. Sure. Principle yes. abstract. There is no. There is no. Yeah, conceptual problem. Okay. If we had, uh, for instance, in the old uh, uh, old uh, one loop result, we had the equations of motion many many years ago uh, with uh, Bell et al. And from these post-Mikosian equations of motion, you can compute everything, uh, first order, second order, the scattering and all the, okay. So it's not a conceptual problem. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Any other questions, comments? Session. Uh, Hi, um, yeah, thanks again for a very nice talk. So since we have time, so maybe I can ask a slightly technical question. So I'm just curious that um, when you formulate the radiation reaction force in your formulas, then you put this force into the P dot, the uh, change in momentum. So I wonder uh, yeah. if that's a, that's a gauge choice or can you comment more on that? Yes, very good um, question indeed. So. At, at the lowest level, it is um, a gauge choice here for circular orbits, okay? Um, actually, we studied this issue um, a lot um, because you, you still have a sensitivity to the gauge choice when you truncate things to some um, accuracy. So we studied whether the inclusion of uh, uh, a term also in the PR thing. By the way, we have we have a paper where we wrote general expression in a PN expanded way, which contains both um, a radial component uh, of the radiation reaction force and uh, angular momentum uh, component. But we also compared to numerical relativity, and actually, when you compare to numerical relativity up to merger. Um, it is very accurate to include only the angular momentum loss, I mean, in this form, only in this equation of motion, and not to modify the other ones, okay? It's not fully understood what is going on, okay? Uh, but there is no clear need for, I should say, these are for quasi-circular uh, orbits here. When you discuss, uh, yes, I should have said that, when you discuss general elliptic orbits, you absolutely need to have uh, an FR here, okay? But, uh, sorry, here in the PR uh, motion. But, and it is this FR that you can gauge to be um, so small that you can neglect it for circular orbits, but not for elliptic orbits. I see, thank you very much.
So any other comments? I think uh, we are right on time for the talk. So maybe we make an applause again for Tibor.